Yeah, welcome back um, to my video channel, Questions of Doubt um, in Corporate Valuation. My name is Bernhard Schwetzler, and our today's question of doubt is, can I check growth assumptions and determine the value calculations for sanity? And the answer is, of course, yes. We will learn today about a simple model, a simple valuation model that has been developed in the 50s by two researchers named Gordon and Shapiro. And we will see how this Gordon Shapiro model is well equipped to perform these sanity checks for growth in the terminal value calculation. By the way, if you are one of my former students, then you probably don't have to watch this video because you're supposed to know all these things by heart because we have been discussing them extensively in class. But for all others, enjoy. Okay, so let's start with uh, just explaining why this terminal value um, is so important and why it is uh, one of the standard battlefields in the negotiations between buyer and seller about uh, the right valuation of the target company. So usually um, the lifetime of the firm is to be assumed of infinite. And as no sane person makes projections over an infinite time frame, the future is sliced into two parts. The phase one, where you make explicit uh, projections about cash flows, P&L figures, perhaps even balance sheet figures, uh, and the phase two. And the phase two is assumed to last from the end of phase one to infinity. And in phase two, you assume that the firm is slipping into a so-called steady state where all important figures grow at a constant rate. And that means that, of course, the free cash flow is also growing at a constant rate to infinity. And of course, uh, this growth rate in the term of the value calculation has all ingredients that it needs to make it a, a standard battlefield. Yeah? Because um, A, the phase two is far away, five to six years. So there's a high degree of uncertainty about the appropriate growth rate. And B, the choice of this growth rate has a major impact on the terminal value. And by doing so, on the value of the firm as well, because of the terminal value, even in mature firms, contributes more than 50 to 60 percent to the total value of the firm right now. Yeah? OK, so let's first look at uh, some simple math, some simple valuation equations. So if we assume that the free cash flow in the phase number two stays constant to infinity, or the expected free cash flow to be more precise, then we can easily use this uh, perpetuity equation. That is, we simply derive the terminal value by taking this constant free cash flow and dividing it by the WAC as the discount rate. If we assume a growth model, that is uh, that our cash flows, our free cash flows are growing to infinity with a constant rate, then the equation is we take the first year's free cash flow in the phase number two and divide it by the difference between the WAC and G. Yeah? So you see that uh, our terminal value is then simply the present value of a perpetually growing cash flow stream that goes to infinity. Okay, so the first step to derive our Gordon Shapiro equation is now um, to replace our free cash flow by our NOPAT, the net operating profits after taxes, in the first year of our of our phase number two, and multiply it with one minus the retention rate. Yeah? So the retention rate is the fraction of no pad that is set aside in order to acquire new assets. And so one minus Q can also be interpreted as being the payout ratio. That is the fraction of no pad that is paid out as a free cash flow to our debt and equity holders as the investors uh, of our firm. Yeah? So now the open question is, uh, how does the link look like between our retention rate and our growth rate in our valuation equation. So in the first step um, towards this Gordon Shapiro model is I think highlighted by this uh, graph here. Um, and um, the important finding of this graph, at least I hope, is that you cannot growing in a perpetual environment in earnings and in free cash flows without growing in assets at the same time. Okay? So you see here on the left hand side, you see the operating assets or the invested capital here, an example, 100 million. And 
these operating assets produce a certain return on vested capital. So this is the expected operating rate of return of the business of the firm. And it produces by doing so a NOPET of 12 million, that is 100 million times 12%. Yeah? And now it is, I think, obvious that in a perpetual environment that the, the growth rates of these two components has to be equal to each other because if earnings and assets do not grow at the same rate, this ROIC as a connection between the two will either go to infinity or will go to zero and converge to zero. Yeah? So let's look at the first case. Yeah? So case number three here, if earnings grow faster than assets, uh, let's presume that our earnings grow where our whereas our assets stay constant. And that means that from year to year, as the notepad is going to grow, uh, our RIC becomes higher and higher because the constant assets are going to produce higher and higher earnings. And that is, of course, here in an infinite time frame, yields the result that our RIC goes to infinity, which is clearly not very reasonable. Uh, and so this is going to happen as soon as earnings grow faster than assets. Yeah? On the other hand, if earnings grow slower than assets or the other way around, assets grow faster than earnings, then we see a decline in the ROIC. And this uh, decline in the ROIC will hopefully yield the result when ROIC hits the whack that uh, the management of the firm will stop to invest further in this technology and into this firm because this firm is not going to earn its cost of capital. Yeah? So finally, what is reasonable at the end is that assets and earnings grow at the same rate because if they do, the RYC connecting the two stays constant to infinity, which by the way resumes nicely with our assumption that the WAC is also supposed to be constant to infinity. So this is a reasonable case yeah, yeah, that you grow in assets and then you grow in earnings at the same rate. So here is an example um, how this uh, knowledge is going to allow us to disentangle the growth rate into these two components that I would like to show you. So we start here with operating assets of 100 and we assume that these operating assets earn an ROIC of 12%. So in the first year, we have a notepad of 12. I'm sorry. So, and we assume that the firm sets aside 40% of the notepad every year to acquire new assets. Yeah? Uh, and that means that the retention rate is 40% and the payout ratio is 60%. Yeah? So in the first year, our investors get the free cash flow of 60% times 12 is 7.2. And 4.8, that is 40% of the 12, is assumed to be used in order to acquire new additional assets. Note that here for our old assets, we always assume that um, they stay constant. And that means that we just always reinvest the depreciation and capex for this part is equal to the depreciation. And so the growth in assets is then by these 4.8 newly acquired assets that have been financed by this retention. Yeah? So you see our operating assets grow from 100 to 104, and then these 104 again earn 12%, that's 12.58. Again, 60% is paid out, 40% is retained to buy new assets. And now if we calculate first the growth rate in the assets, then you see that in the first year, and of course in the second, uh, and in the years to follow, the growth rate of our assets is 4.8%, yeah, from 104.8 uh, to 100. And you see that our asset growth can be decomposed into these two components, return, ROIC, and retention rate. Yeah? So if we multiply and combine 40% retention with 12% ROIC, we exactly get these 4%, 4.8% as the growth rate in our assets. Yeah. And as our assets are supposed to earn a constant rate of return, of course, this transposes this 4.8 growth rate into 4.8 growth for our notepad. And as our retention and our payout ratio is constant, 
finally, this also yields a growth rate of 4.8% in our free cash flow. Yeah? So just talking about the two components, um, ROIC has an impact on growth because the higher the ROIC is, the higher the notepad that is generated by a given asset rate. And if you apply a constant retention, that means that the higher the rate of return multiplied with a constant re retention rate, that gives us more assets that are to be bought at a higher rate of return. Yeah? And on the other hand, Q drives the growth rate. The higher Q at a given ROIC is, the higher the fraction of a given notepad that is set aside uh, and used in order to buy new assets. Yeah? So you see that we actually talk about a two-dimensional problem that growth can be decomposed into two components, retention times return is equal to growth. Yeah? So, and now plugging this relation into our valuation equation, here Q times ROIC is equal to G, yields the final famous Gordon Shapiro model. So either this is the more convenient form or the more, let's say, widespread in use equation here. We solve here for Q, so it's G over RIC, and plug it into our equation for Q, then it's this version, or the other version simply leaves the G and replaces the G by this combination, Q times RIC. Note that it's still our good old growth equation that we had at the beginning. So the first step is we replace the free cash flow by notepad times 1 minus Q. And the second part is we replace Q by the ratio of G over RYC. Yeah? So it is still our standard growth model now in the version of Gordon Shapiro. And the bright side of, of Gordon Shapiro is now that it allows us to look deeper into the value contribution of growth. Yeah? Because where the G actually increases the terminal value, and by doing so, of course, uh, the current value of the firm crucially depends on whether ROIC is higher, lower, or equal to the WAC, to the cost of capital of the firm. And that means that the impact of G crucially depends on whether our new assets that we acquire via retention carry a positive net present value or, which is the same, have a positive excess rate of return that goes above our WAC. So that becomes immediately clear if we set WAC and RIC equal to each other. So if you replace RIC by WAC in this equation here, rearrange a bit, then you get this equation that the value of uh, the terminal value is equal to the notepad divided by the WAC and G does not play any role, which makes perfect sense because if you just earn your cost of capital, then it doesn't make a difference on, a, on whether you set a lot of money aside and retain and uh, grow or whether you set no money at all aside because uh, you just do not create any value by realizing zero net present value investments. Yeah? Even worse, if WEC is greater than RIC, then you burn money by growing. Yeah? So you set aside money to realize investments that carry a negative net present value. And in this equation, that yields the result that if G is going to increase, you burn more money in bad projects and you get a lower terminal value. And finally, of course, this is then what we want to have is RIC exceeds the WAC, that is our investment opportunity carry an excess rate of return that is positive. And that then means that if we increase G, then we realize more good investment opportunities that carry a positive net present value. And by doing so, G has a positive impact on the value of the firm and on the terminal value. Okay, so what is an important implication of this result is actually that we all should stop to bicker around and fight around G in the negotiations. Yeah? Instead of fighting around G and negotiating around G, we should talk about combinations of Q and ROIC that yield a particular G. Yeah? 
because you can create any growth rate by many, many different combinations of Q and ROIC, and not all of these combinations uh, to create value for the owners of the firm. Yeah? So let's just presume that we have a growth of the 4%, which to most of us would seem to be very high. Yeah? So let's start down here with the case number two. We may create this 4% growth by having a very high retention rate. 50% of all our notepads uh, in the future will be set aside in order to buy new assets and a low rate of return. Yeah? So the rate of return is just 8%. Yeah? So if we have a whack on firm level that is 10%, clearly we destroy value by growing yeah? because here uh, we have a negative excess rate of return of 2%. Yeah? On the other hand, the same 4% can be created by combining a lower retention rate, 25%, and a higher rate of return, 16%, also yield if combined a growth rate of 4%. And clearly here we create value. Yeah? So we have an excess rate of return of 16% minus 10%, which is plus 6%. Yeah? When just looking at the 4% growth, we cannot distinguish the two. Yeah? So in that sense, it's way, way more important to talk about combinations of Q and ROIC that create a certain G instead of bickering around and fighting around just on naked growth rates. Yeah? So, and now we are at um, our sanity check um, that uh, can be derived from our Gordon Shapiro model. So it also relates to this magic triangle that is uh, retention times return is growth. And if you look in the valuation report in your own or perhaps in the one um, that is brought to you by the other side on the negotiation table, then at least two of these three corners of this magic triangle can be derived. Yeah? You can derive the growth rate because the growth rate is a standard component in our in our valuation report. And by looking at the last year, the terminal value year, you can also easily calculate the retention rate. And then you can rearrange this term and this equation and simply solve for the implied ROIC and compare this implied ROIC against the cost of capital, which is also, of course, available in the valuation report. Yeah? So we did this here for an example. So you see here, this is an example out of a valuation report or out of our, our um, class material for the corporate valuation class. And you see here, the first step is let's calculate our uh, retention rate. So you see here in the terminal value year, we have uh, roughly 58 million notepad and we have 52 million roughly free cash flow. So the difference between the two is the absolute amount that is set aside in order to acquire new assets. Yeah? So in our case, it's 5.9 million. And you can easily see by looking at this transition between NOPAT and the free cash flow that it is here, the depreciation is 55 million and CapEx is, is 60.1. That means 5.1 million is here invested into new fixed assets and 1 million is invested into new networking capital. Yeah? So this is the absolute amount. And knowing the absolute amount, we can easily calculate the retention rate in percent. So 75.8 minus 51.2 over 75.8. So 11.4% are retained every year from now to infinity in the term of the value calculation. Yeah? So uh, in this valuation report, we have assumed, it's not shown here, but I tell you, we have assumed the growth rate of 1.5%. And so the implied ROIC is 1.5% over 11.4% is 13.1%. Yeah? And this is then the figure, this implied ROIC is then finally to be compared against the WAC, the cost of capital. And here, this is also not shown, but I tell you, in this example that we just have calculated, uh, the WAC is roughly 8.4%. So you see that this sanity check has been passed by the valuation report. Uh, the firm actually earns money with its new investments that it takes. So our growth 
is here value enhancing or even value creating. So I would like to show you another example uh, that I've just picked up here. So let's perform this in this case, our sanity check. So first step is calculate our retention rate. So here in this table, you see um, our EBIT is 11.5, our taxes is 4.1. So 11.5 minus 4.1 is 7.4 million is the notepad. And our free cash flow is 3.2 percent, uh, 3.2 million, and our perpetual growth rate is 2 percent, and our WEC is 7.6 percent in this case. Yeah. So here we go. So you see here our retention rate is 11.5 minus 4.1. That's what that was the tax. So this is our notepad minus 3.2 million, which is the free cash flow, over. 11.5 minus 4.1, that was our notepad of 7.4, is 56.7%. Yeah, that means that for this firm to be valued from now to infinity or from the terminal value starting point to infinity, more than 50% every year are set aside to acquire new assets. Yeah? So, and now let's combine this uh, with our growth rate. The growth rate was given here to be 2%. So, our implied RIC is 2%, over 56.7% is 3.52%, so it's rather low. And if you finally compare this 3.52% against uh, our cost of capital of 7.6%, then you can see that uh, this example did not pass our sanity check. Yeah? So the rate of return here that is earned 3.5% is way too low. It's not even half the whack. Yeah? So in that sense, our firm is supposed to extensively burn money in the terminal value calculation. So how could a quick fix look like if you look at these figures and just have two more hours or three more hours for the presentation? A quick fix would be simply to replace here the ROIC by the WAC and by doing so, assuming that the firm at least would not destroy any value uh, in the term in the value calculation. So in that sense, you either adjust the growth rate. So in our case, it would then be you keep the retention rate of 56.7% and multiply it with 7.6%. And then, of course, you get a significantly higher growth rate. I think it's 2.4%. Or the other way around, you leave the 2% uh, and replace ROIC and then get a retention rate that is way, way lower than the 56.7, which is also neutral. And, of course, that yields exactly the same uh, terminal value. And then you get here um, a retention rate that is uh, significantly below 30%, I think it's 26 point something, which would be a nice homework for you to check. Okay, so that much for today. Thank you.